Well, good morning and welcome to worship here at First Baptist. I am not Robert Prince. I am Jonathan Sumner, the pastor for worship ministries here at First Baptist. And we are glad you're all here, whether you're visiting or you're a member here. We're glad you're here. If you are a visitor, on the inside flap of your bulletin is a QR code. We invite you to fill that out and so we can know you're here. Um, sorry, this is my first time doing this. You think I have it under control? Um, no, <laughs> we are First Baptist where we uh, embody Christ, love all people, and introduce them to the God we love. Following our worship, there's coffee as well as a connection time behind us in the gym. Uh, our, uh, so we'd love to have you for coffee and a chance to connect with you more. As we begin our worship, let's pray. Dear God, silence all voices within our minds but your own. Help us to seek and be able to follow your will. May our prayers be joined with those of our sisters and brothers in the faith that together we may glorify your name and enjoy your fellowship forever. In Jesus' name, in Jesus name we pray, amen. Please stand as we begin our worship with our hymn, God Who Made Us. It is uh, an insert if you got one. Uh, it is not from the Baptist hymnal, but it is a great hymn from our other Baptist brothers and sisters, God Who Made Us. for this, but I would just like to say thank you to whoever came up with the idea of banisters on these stairs. Um, I enjoyed that very much, so thank whatever committee you are, um, or whoever nailed them there. I would like for you to join me in hearing the word of God from the um, epistle of James. If any of you are suffering, they should pray. If any of you are happy, they should sing. If any of you are sick, they should call for the elders of the church, and the elders should pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer that comes from faith will heal the sick, for the Lord will restore them to health, and if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. For this reason, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful in what it can achieve. Elijah was a person just like us. When he earnestly prayed that it wouldn't rain, no rain fell for three and a half years. He prayed again, God sent rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now will you join me in prayer? God, first, let us thank you for this day where we can come together as your church and join our hearts together in prayer to you. Sometimes 
We have to pray that we'll be able to pray. And so help us to reach out to each other because sometimes if our hearts are heavy or our spirit is weak, we need a brother or sister in Christ to lift us up in prayer. And God, as you hear our hearts, our deepest sorrows and our greatest needs, our happiest thoughts and our deepest joys, we ask above all that you give us faith. Give us faith to believe in you, what you do for each, us each day, and what you did for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. stand as we continue with our worship with him 445 sweet hour of prayer
Amen. You may be seated as we invite Reverend Rebecca Mathis up to bring God's word to us this morning. Well, good morning. It is so good to be back with you this morning. I was here a little over a year ago, and I was delighted that I got to be invited back and be with you today. Before we dig in this morning, I, I want to take a point of privilege and, and say thank you. For this specific church, I like to think about all the different churches that have been part of my faith story and my faith journey, and I know you can sit and think about all the different churches that have been meaningful to you, um, but for those of you who don't know, I used to be a member here for a very wee bit of time in my life. Uh, when I graduated from Western Carolina University a little over 20 years ago, and before I got married and before I went to seminary, so when I had a different last name and a different career, same person person, I lived in Waynesville, and I was a member here as Dr. Prince was just arriving. Um, and I wasn't here every Sunday. I was one of those people that you saw sometimes and you didn't see, but it was for good reason. I had fallen in love with a college minister um, and, and, and youth pastor who worked at First Baptist of Boone. And so I lived in Waynesville, and he lived in Boone, and so many a weekend I was traveling that road to go see my boyfriend and then my fiance, and then later uh, we married and I moved away from here. But during those few years when we were dating and falling in love and becoming engaged, I called this church family home and sang in the choir right back there on the Sundays that I was here. And so I'm very grateful for the role that your congregation played in our nurturing um, our, our love story, um, and now we've been going strong 19 and a half years um, now as a clergy couple. And, and many of you know my husband is also in the pulpit this morning over at the First Baptist Church of Silva. So I'm very grateful. And congratulations on 200 years of being a faith community here in the heart of Waynesville. What a testimony. So I've got a question for you this morning. Who taught you to pray? What were your earliest prayers like? What did you learn? What were you taught to pray about? How are you supposed to pray? If you grew up like me, your earliest prayers probably were something like, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, right? Or maybe it was, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Or maybe your mother taught you or your father taught you at a young age the Lord's Prayer. I know mine was in the front cover of my Bible and it had like fancy scroll work around it. And the version I learned was about debts and debtors. And then sometimes I was at a different church and they'd say trespasses and trespassers. And then I'd get very confused. And still to this day, I listen in to see what are the, which, which is it going to be. I think we're trespasses here probably, right? Okay. You know, but we, you, we learn to pray different ways. We pray before meals. We pray before bedtime. We pray at church. Now, I grew up in a, in a Baptist church in the South, and so I was a GA, and I was an actine. And on Wednesday nights, we prayed from the prayer calendar. You know, those missionaries, it was their birthday, and we would pray for missionaries on their birthday every Wednesday night. And even as a kid, I used to feel bad for the missionaries who had birthdays that didn't fall on a Wednesday. <laughs> I would think about that. I'd go home and I'd think, wow, all those missionaries got prayed for, but what about those Thursday birthdays? You know, I figured our GA as an acting leader had them covered the rest of the week. But we're taught these different ways to pray. And the truth of the matter is that for many of us who's grown up in church and we've been followers of Jesus for a long time, we find that throughout our faith journeys, we have a lot of, we have a lot of different ways to pray. We have a lot of different tools, if you will, in our prayer toolbox. We know that not all situations are the same, are they? And so not all of our prayers need to be the same. Sometimes we do need a tool like a prayer calendar to remind us to pray for someone else, and sometimes not. Sometimes we need to recite an old, familiar prayer, and sometimes we need to find new words, words to describe our new request or situation. 
Sometimes our prayers are in song, and other times our prayers are in silence. With over 200 years of church history here, not necessarily all just in this room, I know there are a lot of things in your prayer toolbox that you could share this morning. So do we really need another sermon about prayer? Well, if you pay attention to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus seems to think so. And if Jesus' followers and Jesus' disciples needed a refresher on prayer, then perhaps it wouldn't hurt us to have a bit of a refresher either. So let's look together at the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. You can follow along there or on the screen. I'm actually going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, but I think we'll be pretty close. Here are these words from the Gospel of Matthew. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door. Pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, it's really easy for us to jump straight to the familiar part of this passage. We can read it a few times. We can refresh our memories. We can check it off and we can move on, right? Jesus taught us how to pray in the Bible. We've memorized it. We've sung about it. We say it fairly regularly. The end. I'm good. We're good. Let's move on, right? Mm. Not so fast. To fully understand what's going on in this passage, it's important for us to to leave the less familiar part for a moment. Let's look, let's take the familiar part that, you know, move it over here, and let's look at the less familiar part that the passage begins with. In fact, I want to jump a little further back. Let's jump all the way back to the start of the chapter. Remember, here in the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to find ourselves in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching to a large crowd, and in this portion of his sermon, he's warning his listeners to be mindful of their motivations and their actions. This is not just a how to pray moment. This is a how to approach prayer moment. Chapter 6 begins in this way. Look at verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. He then goes on in verses 2 through 4 to talk about not being showy when you're being generous. He, doesn't, he, he cautions against showiness and drawing attention to yourself when you're giving to the needy. And then he hops back to prayer in verse 5. But look again. Verse 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. He's saying, what's in your heart when you start praying? What are you thinking about? What is your approach? He is cautioning his listeners to not be showy about prayer. Look at verse 6. But whenever you pray, go into your room, shut the door, Pray to your Father in secret. 
and your Father will reward you. So does this mean we're not supposed to pray together? Are we only supposed to pray alone behind a closed door? No, this is not about individual prayer or corporate prayer. He doesn't actually say you have to go in your room by yourself. We are in a room together corporately. It's more about how do we approach and come to God before we begin praying. What is our motivation? What is our approach to prayer? There's a song I learned, oh gosh, over 20 years ago now when I was in college that I think really captures what this should feel like. Again, before we get to the familiar passage, we're talking about that approach, that invitation into that space to be with God, to enter into that relationship with God. And I want you to listen to these lyrics of this of this song is probably not a familiar song to you, but it describes how this prayer should feel. He is my light and my salvation. Whom have I to fear? And in this secret place I'll hide and pray that I might hear a simple word. Oh, how I would have despaired if you had not come found me there. I can lean against your throne and find my peace. Find my peace. And when my enemies draw near, I pray that they will find that I'm protected, I'm secure, all tempest he will bind with a mighty word. Oh, how I would have despaired if you had not come found me there. I can lean against your throne and find my peace, find my peace. Doesn't that feel good? That image that we in prayer can lean against the throne of God and find peace. What an approach to prayer. It, I think about how that feels when you sink into a big, comfortable beanbag chair. You know, or when you lay in a hammock and the warmth of the sun is on your face. Or think about when you were a child and you would just sort of flop onto your mom or dad or your grandparents and there was just everything was right in the world. Or think about your own children or grandchildren when they flop on you and it's kind of heavy and they just lay there and you can kind of rub their shoulder. Our our daughter actually is sick right now. She's 13. She's home by herself, but she's good. Uh, But she's not been feeling well for the past few days and she doesn't flop on me much anymore because she's 13. But just the other night, her ear was hurting and she came and crawled and just flaked on top of me and I could feel the full weight of her and she lay there and she just breathed, you know, she was breathing slowly and I just rubbed her hair. And that's how I think this feeling is supposed to be, this relationship that we have with God, that we don't just rush through words and we don't say a whole lot of words, but we come into this quiet, intimate, holy space of prayer with God, our Father, where we find peace. Jesus tells us to go into our room and to shut the door. Jesus cares about our motives when we approach him. And so he invites us to leave all the false pretenses, to leave the the motivations at the door, to trust, to have an authentic relationship with him, and we'll be rewarded for approaching with humility and trust rather than ambition. So Jesus continues after he's invited us into this holy space, this quiet space, this gentle space with God. 
And he tells us, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. He says, your father already knows what you need. That's a good word, isn't it? God already knows what you need today. So we come into this space of prayer, this place of trust, this place of intimacy with God. We don't need to ramble. We don't need to to heap up empty phrases. We don't need to impress God. We don't need to flatter God. God knows what we need He's ready and he's willing to dialogue with us in that space, whether alone or together as a community of faith. So then Christ gives us a model prayer. He gives us the right tools to put in our toolbox to know what to say and how to say it. I like how Lisa Nichols Hickman describes this in her book. She has a book of of prayer and reflections called The Worshiping Life. And in the book, she shares the following way to understand this very familiar passage. So consider the Lord's Prayer from from this angle. Our Father who art in heaven, relationship. Hallowed be thy name, revere. Thy kingdom come, renew. Thy will be done, reveal, on earth as it is in heaven, reconcile. Give us this day our daily bread, replenishment. Forgive us our debts, ugh, remove, as we forgive our debtors, relinquish. Lead us not into temptation, reject, but deliver us from evil, Redirect, for thine is the kingdom, recognize, and the power, respect, and the glory, resurrect, forever, remember. Amen. Isn't that good? What if our prayers captured all of this each time we came into that room with God, that they were prayers of relationship and reverence, of renewal, of revealing, reconciliation, replenishment, removing, relinquishing, rejecting, and redirecting, recognizing, respecting, resurrecting, and remembering. Wow, a lot can happen in a short prayer. Even within the shortest of prayers, God moves and is at work. But let's be honest, y'all. There are many times in our lives where it is hard to pray. We can't find the right words. Our familiar words and our prayers start to feel hollow. Y'all, sometimes we just don't want to pray. I know you're not supposed to say that in church, but it's true. Right? Sometimes it's hard and we don't know what to say and we don't know what to do. In this same book, Lisa Nichols Hickman, she shares an insight about the Lord's Prayer. She, she shares a story about how when she was a hospital chaplain, she was in a, a room with a patient and the patient asked her to recite the Lord's Prayer and she started and she forgot the words. Has that ever happened to you? You start and then, or you get in a loop. You can't remember if you prayed for the daily bread or not. You can't remember if you prayed to forgive your debtors or debts. And and our children, when we taught them the Lord's Prayer as kids, they would do that sometimes. They would loop over and over. They'd pray for daily bread like three times because they'd get lost in the prayer. Happens to all of us. And sometimes we can't remember the words and sometimes we don't have the right words And we really don't know what to pray for. And so we get stuck. So I'm going to share an aha moment with you that I've had over the past few months regarding prayer. And maybe, hopefully, it will resonate with you as well. Some months ago, my husband and I were talking about something. It doesn't really matter. I can't remember exactly what we were grappling with at the moment but we are on always pondering life and trying to figure things out and we were stuck on a topic and my husband said well I guess we just need to keep praying and I said yeah but I don't know what to pray for 
I was like, I don't even know what to say. And he said, yeah, I don't either. I said, wow, we're a pair, a clergy couple, and we're not sure what to pray for. Have you ever had a moment like that? You just weren't sure? You know, sometimes you say, God, I really want this to happen, or God, oh, I really don't want that to happen. And, and you, 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 you put those into words to God, and you hope he's going to make happen what you were hoping for. But what happens when you're just stuck? And you're standing in front of God and you've come to God intimately into that holy space and you're there and then this is your prayer. Hmm? Well, sometimes we don't have the words. So within that same time frame, it was a few days, maybe a few weeks later, I was over at work at Lake Junaluska. And as you all know, I'm a Baptist working over with our good Methodist brothers and sisters at Lake Junaluska. And so... Um, I get very excited when there are Baptists on the grounds, and my colleagues know it. We get a daily schedule in the morning, so anytime there's a Baptist church or a Baptist retreat going on, I'm like, my people are here. And so, and so we tease each other. And so um, earlier this summer, uh, a Baptist theologian, a Baptist pastor, um, Reverend Dr. David Hughes, was on the grounds, and he was leading a retreat. And so um, I had the opportunity to have lunch with him. And I was not familiar with the organization that he was with. It's called the Transforming Center. And they lead different prayer retreats and discernment retreats and um, talk a lot about the role of Sabbath and how having that quiet space with God is really important. And so it was a really fascinating conversation. I was really jazzed after lunch, and I, I found out they have a whole podcast series. And I drive back and forth and back and forth between Silva and Waynesville every day. And so I started listening to these podcasts that are um, by the founder of the center, Ruth Haley Barton. And they're just, they're wonderful. And I said, well, I'm going to just start at the beginning. And so I started at the beginning, and the first few episodes were about prayer and this idea that we've been talking about this morning of entering into that space and being present with God in the quiet and, and, and how to approach God in prayer. And she said, you know, sometimes you don't know what to pray. And I thought, oh, I know, I've been stuck. And she says, so you should, pray a, you should pray a prayer of indifference. Y'all, I'm opinionated. I'm not indifferent. Okay, so I was like, what in the world is a prayer of indifference? That doesn't sound like the kind of prayer you should pray. It sounds like you're praying like you don't care or you're apathetic, a prayer of apathy. But that's not what a prayer of indifference is. A prayer of indifference is approaching God and being indifferent to anything but the will of God. That's good, isn't it? Being indifferent to anything but the will of God. A prayer of indifference is to say, I am indifferent to my human wants or desires. I am indifferent to my own way that I'm seeing this. I am indifferent to what the world is, is echoing in my ears. I am indifferent to everything except for God's will. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. I'm sure you've heard that phrase before, but what a prayer. To pray for God's will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. So that's the prayer that we can pray when we get stuck, when we're not sure, when we forget the Lord's prayer, when we don't have the words to say, that's the prayer that we can latch on to. In other words, it's right there in what Jesus taught us. It's those four words. Thy will be done. For when we pray, thy will be done, we're saying to God, God, I'm coming into this space. I'm trusting you so much. I'm leaning up against your throne. I'm seeking that peace that only you can provide. And the rest of the Lord's prayer will fall into place when we pray, thy will be done, because it is God's will that God provides our daily bread. It is God's will that we forgive those who have wronged us. It is God's will and God's nature to forgive us when we repent. It is God's will that we not be led into temptation. It is God's will that we are kept far, far from evil. It's okay if you get mixed up in the prayer and you don't remember all the words, just remember the four. And if you can't remember the four, just kind of look up and hold your hands up and say, God, I'm indifferent 
to anything but your will. And the neat thing in our own lives is we started praying that prayer and things have become clearer. No, it's not that everything is just tied up in a perfect bow and everything is rainbows and sunshine and unicorns. But when we pray to be in the will of God, we can sense that peace. We're one step closer to that peace. God wants good things for us. God wants good things for you. God wants good things for this church. And Jesus teaches us to ask for the will of God and to take that, that it will take hold in our lives. Jesus assures us that if we approach God in prayer with a posture of humility and we ask for God's will to be done in our lives, our sins will be forgiven. That's good news. This is what being in right relationship with God and with one another looks like. So maybe your prayer toolbox is full of devotional guides and prayer calendars and candles and familiar passages that you've learned over the years. Or maybe your prayer toolbox is rusty. Or maybe there's some tools in there you haven't used in a while. Or maybe it feels empty. Here's the good news. Jesus says you don't have to say very many words. Jesus says you don't have to know all the fancy words. In fact, he discourages it. He says, open your hands, utter these words. Thy will be done. And we see this echoed in Scripture. What does Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 tell us? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Thy will be done. Straight path. Let's pray that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And we'll be one moment closer to that sense of peace. Oh, how I would have despaired if you had not come found me there. I can lean against your throne and find my peace. I can lean against your throne and find, lean against your throne and find, lean against your throne and find my peace. He is my light and my salvation. Whom have I to fear? Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we as a community of faith, of believers here in the heart of Waynesville, we've gathered this morning, we've come into this quiet space with the echoes of the world outside and the gentle rain, God, we've come into this approaching your throne, seeking your peace. And we come with a whole host of prayers, of worries and of anxieties, of joys and celebrations. Some of us know exactly what we want to pray for, and others of us don't have the words. And God, you tell us in this passage, that's okay. And you give us words when we don't have any. And so, God, as we leave this place this morning and go out into our daily lives, remind us that you're calling to each of us to be in right relationship with you. And remind us that we have this beautiful tool, a way to approach you, even when we're not sure of the words. Give us open hands and open hearts to hear you moving, working in our lives as we now collectively pray the prayer that you did teach us to pray, God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please stand and continue to worship with us. sometimes um, when just overwhelmed, confused, hurting, um, and you just don't know what to pray, like she was saying, that um, it helps to remember who God is. You know, he's holy. He's, um, he's good. God is love. And God is on his throne forever and ever. Hey. Uh-huh. 
Bet you can't guess why I'm here. Um, we have uh, seven beautiful children up in the nursery this morning. They're having a ball with the Tranthams. They're up there taking care of them. Um, during the second hour after the service is over, we split that group into two classes. We have infants, and then we have some preschoolers. We have some two-year-olds and some four- and five-year-olds, and they are ready to learn all about Jesus, and I need somebody to teach them. And that person is in this room. So if you think that's you, I need you to come talk to me. So we um, need somebody every other month. So we have Darnelli is also teaching. Hi, Darnelli. Thanks so much. Darnelli's doing it every other month. So I need somebody to pick up the alternating months. We do it one month at a time because the curriculum is structured one month at a time. So you teach one concept for four weeks. Then you get a break and you get to go back to your adult class. And then you come back and you teach a new concept for four weeks. And it's awesome. It's fun. They're ready. And I need you. So come find me. Thank you, Emily. A few more announcements. Um, you'll see in the back of your bulletin, uh, Kid Creative course has already started. If you, We had 48 out of our 62-ish signed up, so we're off to a really good start. Um, heard some really good first day reports, so uh, just keep praying for those kids and our ministry and more workers. If you want to come, come talk to Faith. She would love to have you uh, work with those little kids as much as possible. Uh, some other things to think about, Trunk or Treat is around the corner. So now it's time to start thinking about bringing in candy. There are uh, boxes to uh, donate in the office as well as back here by the fireplace. Uh, let's see what else. I think that's about it, unless anyone has something I missed. But if not, let's stand and close our worship with our final hymn, Take the Name of Jesus With You. serve all.